Good afternoon. Some of the changes that are happening in society today, you will not ever see directly. But instead, you're going to sort of be on the experiencing end of it. And you may not even know the enormous amount of computation, the enormous change in perspective that's occurring behind the scenes. Let's consider just as a quick example what happens when you watch a movie on Netflix or a TV program on Netflix. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have had a chance to look at House of Cards, but House of Cards is essentially an algorithmically driven production series. Netflix is well known, and they've done this for, for years. They were one of the first to start moving at recommender systems on uh, their platform. And so what happens with Netflix, every time you pause a movie, every time you stop during a TV show, every time you're bored and you fast forward through it, every time there's a particularly romantic episode that you decide you want to review, Netflix captures that. It's recorded as an event, and each of those events are then in turn used to create the algorithm that they use to write this program. Education is one of those areas that we hold as being sort of above an analytic model at some levels. You know, there's magic that happens when a student sits in a classroom with a faculty member. There's magic that happens as a group of doctoral students get together, create ideas, exchange ideas. I mean, there's just no way you could possibly algorithmically capture the nature of that experience. Just like, of course, there's no way that you could create a very popular show just simply looking at the event patterns of people pausing and advancing forward. So what I'm arguing here is that we as educators need to be particularly aware of what's happening with the data that's being generated to the education process and the impact that that's starting to have on the ways in which we create and plan going forward with education. Some of you are going to find this very irritating, particularly because you would like to see education as a creative process above analysis. There's something magic and intangible that happens. We can't duplicate it. We can't recreate it. In our society today, though, we're in a point where roughly everything that we do, every action that we make, is captured. We pay for our actions in series of code. As you're taking pictures, as you're tweeting, as you're making notes during the conference here, as it's being recorded or streamed, these elements are being captured. And the price for that flexibility, for that accessibility, is that it's made available for something, as I mentioned, that none of us will ever pay a lot of attention to. And that's analysis and understanding to the trends and patterns that exist belief, uh, beneath it. Because from the perspective of many individuals, particularly data scientists, really all the world is data. You are data. Your DNA is data. We can reduce things down to basically a sequence of data points. And then how they interact will help us understand a huge array of things. From a learning perspective, the trails that you generate when you log on to Angel, when you post something on Twitter, that you generate as you walk through campus with your mobile device, as you log on to Facebook, like a picture, as you go to the ATM, you take out some money. All of those activities, those trails that you reveal, can reveal a range about you, your sentiments, your attitudes, your social connections. Just as an example on Facebook, for example, I don't have to go on Facebook and say, you know, this is my political beliefs, or these are my religious beliefs. Instead, once you strip away family, because family is uh, sort of a bit of an absolute that may not reflect your views, but you can understand a lot about a person just simply by understanding their social connections and the people that they have voluntarily connected to. So even though you may not be very active in liking things on Facebook, Facebook is very active in understanding the nature of your connections, and by doing that, they're able to infer an awful lot about you. As Eric Schmidt from Google has stated, that the key for them as a successful platform is to give you information that you want to know before you start thinking that you need to search for it. So it's really anticipating your action, anticipating what you're going to do next. Now, from a perspective of an artist, in this case, a designer at Google, found that Google was having issues looking at two colors of blue that they wanted to use on their page. In true Google fashion, those two blues weren't enough, so they decided we can't choose between these two. Let's do A-B tests on 41 shades instead and try and make sure which one ends up producing the best results for us. This designer being substantially offended because his creativity, what he does was being stripped out of the process, ended up leaving Google. 
uh, because he just couldn't function under that kind of an environment because he felt his creativity was being squashed. So that's the context. We talk a little bit now about what's happening in the world around us, and this is something I suspect all of you in higher education are aware of because you've seen a transition in your student profiles. You've seen a transition in the expectations of your students, and you've also seen broader societal transitions as well. One of the most dramatic transitions that we've seen in our era in particular is reflected in this chart. And this chart basically looks, I mean, I'm going to talk you through it, so even if you can't see little dots, don't worry about that. But this chart looks at human uh, capacity, uh, capability, and employment by particular fields. So it's basically looking at if you're an individual who has basically only done on-the-job on training, the chart on your left-hand side, in virtually every field you've had enormous job losses since 2007. As you go up by education, you move toward your right on the chart. And once you get to the point where you have either a bachelor's degree or a graduate degree, every field, even traditional manufacturing sector fields or agriculture sectors or retail or construction, every field, with the exception of finance, I wonder why, has had an increase in employment. So what you're seeing here is enormous convulsions happening in the labor market. And those convulsions the people being protected from the bulk of those changes are those, regardless of their field, that have a certain quality of education. And that's also reflected in charts like this that emphasize that a greater percentage of developed economies, such as in the US, is now involved in what's called interaction work. Interaction work are those kinds of activities that require creativity. They require people to be able to work together. They require people to collaborate, they require people to generate something new that didn't exist before. Relating to that market transition as well toward creativity and interaction oriented work, we also see an interesting period of time happening where right now there are more Android activations by day than there are babies being born by day globally, right? And the, there's no relation there I don't think, but the <laughs> The point is that most of you now, and you might, some of you might have seen an image, I should have probably popped it up here, but the image between 2005 with Pope Benedict versus 2013. And you know, one image, everybody's standing there, the next image, everybody's there taking pictures, and they've got iPads and tablets and phones out. And so this is another reality that we face in terms of an educational perspective, a dramatically changing job market, dramatically changing needs of graduate uh, profiles, and yet everything is transitioning into a more decentralized format. So the university system as such is facing something where students no longer have to come to us to get what they need necessarily, just like you don't have to go to a landline to call. It goes with you. Your connection to everything goes with you wherever you go. Another key aspect of that transition is also related to the change in diversity of students entering higher education. Now I've been in a variety of education sectors. I've been in a community college format. I've been in a, what you would call an R1 research university, and now I'm with an exclusively online program as well. And in every single instance, in a period of literally years, the profile of students seems to be changing. And one of the biggest aspects now is basically a diversification of students. If, you're, if you were to draw and say, this is what a Penn State student looks like, that image today should be very different than what it was even 10 years ago, just because of the changing profile of students and, and the population as a whole. Market's changing, technology's changing, student profiles are changing, but equally important, knowledge production is changing. So this is looking at just the growth of active academic journals going back to uh, the uh, 17th century, and it's very much a consistent, steady increase with a 3.5% year-over-year increase in journal activity meaning that there is an awful lot more knowledge out there. There's a lot of information, and people need to start thinking of new ways of making sense of that. Related to that is this growth of openness in education. So journals, academic journals in particular, either for free or with access, where you have to pay in order to have your article listed, which is technically not free, but whatever. So in all sectors, that's grown enormously. Dramatic increases in journals being published. So we end up with this space then where the knowledge needs of society are very much in flux, but even more disconcerting is the foundation whereby we make sense of that change is in itself under a period of dramatic flux as well. And so we get to a point where P.W. Anderson uh, 
very presently stated in uh, 1970s that more is different. The structure of knowledge, the challenges that the universities face today are of such a scope and a scale that we need to start thinking about how do we respond. Just doing more of what we've done is not necessarily a sufficient response. In every sense, the education market has stalled in terms of growth with the exception of online or digital learning markets. They're reporting growth that, and this is literally from K to 12 through to online learning, through to uh, in the higher ed space, corporate learning are reporting, at, whereas the traditional market is looking at about 7% increase, these areas are looking at, at 30 plus percent increases. And as you're aware, as I mentioned earlier, each of these activities in an online space further contributes to our problem of we now have more data, more events, more data points to look at and consider. Now you throw MOOCs into that mix, and that just messes everything up. And I know Penn State is uh, taken, and from the conversations I've had, has taken a very uh, proactive or future thinking view of Coursera and their participation in MOOCs. But every time you have a chunk of students, and now instead of having 200 students in a class, which might be big, now you've got 15,000 or you've got 40,000. And that completely alters the scale of data, which will then in turn completely alter the way that we come to understand parts of the learning process. And that's what I specifically want to spend some time talking about now, is what are the implications of this? What are the implications of the data that we have access to and how does it change how we think and function as a system? I suspect all of you are aware that networks are kind of a big deal these days. Um, whether it's the mobile devices that you're using or whether it's the technologies, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or whatever else you're involved in. But within science as well, there's a growing recognition of complexity of networks as really underpinning all aspects of what we do. So if we want to understand the world, one way to do that is to understand connections. Here's an example that goes back uh, in where an individual in the 1940s was looking at trying to understand how science relates to technology. So this individual sat down and literally hand drew how he felt fields of science, in this case looking specifically at chemistry, how that's connected to other spaces. This will make a little bit more sense later, but now there's just, humor me and I'm talking about connections. So more recently, the Public Library of, uh, of Science has posted how academic fields are interconnected based on publication citations, right? What is it about certain fields that produces collaboration, interdisciplinary participation? What is it about fields that results in them essentially staying as isolated domains? And then in turn, what's the ultimate impact of those isolated domains? Similarly, you see in almost all specters of when we try to understand political activity, we turn to networks. When we try to understand the food cycle, we turn to networks. When we try to understand the neurons in the brain and how to deal with brain health concerns, uh, the conversation turns to networks. When we look at the tradition or the history of ideas, the exact same impact. So this is a diagram, which you can't read, but of philosophy. These are the big thinkers in philosophy that have contributed to one another and contribute to the development of ideas. So if you look sort of at the mid to top left, your left of the diagram, you'll see this particular image. You'll see Plato and Aristotle having been enormously significant in contributing, but you also see a mess of smaller uh, contributions to the history of human thought. Take that to a more recent diagram that Katie Borner has been involved with where she's looking at the architecture of science and the development of academic activity. And here we see the evolution of co-publication within networks. So one way or another, whether it's through analyzing the connections in science, the influence of ideas, or people who publish together, gives, gives us insight into the way in which information is structured or flows. Now this isn't just sort of a little peripheral component that, oh, that's nice to see that the world is connected and knowledge domains are connected and related. Organizations, obviously like Google, are well aware of this and a large part of their interest is to understand how do those connections exist and what's the impact of those connections. And so you have examples like Link Data, which is an attempt to take the knowledge of the world and make it essentially machine readable so that you do not need a human being necessarily to understand what those connections mean. And this was a vision that Tim Berners-Lee had in his initial web document. We just got the HTML part of it, but his interest was in making sure that we understood what connections mean. Don't just point to connections, but actually tell us what those connections mean. And that's what we're returning to now. Um, some of the work that you, some of you may remember this program, uh, James Burke's Knowledge Web. He's got a series of uh, just his 
approach was give me any two things and I will tell you how they're connected. And I don't care if you give me peanut butter and sharks, I'll give you a couple of jumps and I'll tell you how they're connected. And so he really tried to exemplify the network underpinning to the kinds of things that we do and the kinds of things that we're involved with. And similarly, from a perspective of uh, Google again, this is their knowledge graph, which is essentially a semantic web writ large or writ proprietary, if you will, at some levels. And so if you go to the, uh, the knowledge uh, graph site at Google, if you search for something, instead of just giving you the thing, it will give you the trailing connections that form to how you might understand that particular thing. This creates, on uh, a few levels, a particularly unique impact for us in education because through technology and through mobile devices, the knowledge pieces that comprise the web are fragmented. Right? So you no longer exclusively, you start a psychology 101 course, you read the psychology 101 text, do your coursework, complete your exam, and now you know what psychology 101 is about. Instead, today you encounter the ideas of psychology 101 through a mess of TED Talks, blog posts, you might have read an academic article, you may or may not have read the, uh, the course uh, textbook, Perhaps you took part of a course on Coursera. Uh, perhaps it's just you randomly sitting and thinking in a corner. But these are the kinds of ways that we now identify or become aware of a particular subject area. We have this problem, if you will, of knowledge in pieces. On the one hand, knowledge in pieces is terrific. When knowledge becomes more granular, it can be repurposed in novel means. But it also presents an enormous problem from the perspective of a student or from a learning perspective. Because really knowledge development and learning deep quality learning is concerned with understanding how things are related. It's concerned with understanding what is the impact if I change A and B, how does that impact C, D, and E? Or how does that adjust the entire network? So depth of a subject is the recognition. And some of the work, and this was mentioned this morning's talk as well, uh, you know, the work that's been done around expertise emphasizes that an expert thinks in patterns. A novice quite often thinks sort of sequentially. Step one, step two, step three. That's why sometimes uh, the best person to teach a student who's having trouble with a concept is a student who just mastered it because they think in a similar kind of a pattern or similar cycles. An expert in contrast, and that's why if somebody's been, you know, expert in a particular field for a while, they'll try and explain something to you and it just doesn't resonate if you're cold in that field. The value of functioning or relating to someone else who thinks on sort of your pattern or your process can be quite significant in helping you grow and nurture expertise in the field over time. The opportunity here though, and this is what the web does for us and technology does for us on a broad scale, is it allows the externalization of thought. It allows us to take an idea that we've got in our head, make it publicly available for others, and once it's publicly available, it be critiqued, or more importantly, it can be used, reconnected, added, built on to create new things entirely. It allows us then, what's external can be evaluated. And those of you who are familiar with uh, writings of Wittgenstein or Vygotsky, who both really said very similar things about language, namely that it's the externalization of thought and the clarity of thinking through externalization. It gives us an opportunity now to take what students have done that in the past vaporized when they left a classroom. And now we can look at it and we can understand relatedness. How did the student connect those pieces? Did they connect those pieces the right way? Does the way that they connected that concept in chemistry with that concept in biology, does that align with the knowledge graph or the structure that an expert in that field would agree with as well? So it's terrific opportunities. And the best example I've seen on this comes from a, uh, and I suspect those who have been in education while I've seen this, but it's a private universe. And a private universe took a group of students at Harvard and asked them at graduation why we have seasons. And as they asked grads why they have seasons, they found that overwhelmingly they got the answer wrong. They had somehow managed to complete the entire school of education, first K to 12, then eventually getting into higher education, graduating from one of the top schools in the world, and they were unable to explain a basic concept that I think a student in grade two would probably have learned. So in the process, this is what happens when you have knowledge in bits and pieces, because learners will connect those pieces. They'll do it all the time. We do it constantly. 
We walk through, you know, each, each day we're collecting, you know, what we read in the morning newspaper versus what we encountered on, uh, I don't know, Fox News or MNBC or what we saw on CNN or something that we had a conversation with a colleague. We're connecting constantly. The problem is if we're not externalizing that, those connections, that knowledge structure is never made available for, ex uh, for interrogation by others. So with the private universe, what they discovered was that most students felt that we have seasons, their statement was, because we're closer to the sun in summer. And instead, it's due to the tilt of the Earth's axis. But that was their understanding, at least in the northern hemisphere, and it was completely wrong. But this is a challenge from our end in that uh, as we participate in these messed up spaces, we're all over the place, we're on mobile devices, we're on learning management systems, we're on student information systems, blogs, and social media, is that these knowledge elements, for us to understand as educators, did students understand the topics we taught? They're analytically cloaked because they're scattered in a variety of different databases, and they're scattered in a variety of, of different uh, logs. More importantly is from an analytics stance, we have a lot of trouble actually getting at that analytics work because a large portion of what happens in a classroom actually doesn't happen in a classroom. Even a large portion of what happens online doesn't happen online in terms of learning. So you might have them in your learning management system, but they might have a chat window open, or they might be active on Skype, or they might be participating in a Google Hangout. So with these various tools, we have to start conceiving a model of analytics that goes beyond easy data capture to a model that starts to consider the breadth and the scope of analytics broadly. Now I want to look briefly at a few examples of uh, uh, what some universities have done with analytics. A few of these you've probably heard already. Uh, one is Purdue Signals. So Purdue Signals has gotten a lot of attention. It's one of the first tools available, simple approach. They take a variety of uh, data elements and they basically assign to a student they're either green, they're yellow, or they're red. If you're green, that means you're great, you're doing fine. If you've got a yellow, then you need to start thinking about what you're doing in the course. They might give you some advice or guidelines. And if you're red, there are certain specific steps you might need to take to get help beyond that. You also have initiatives such as uh, the uh, Open Learning uh, Initiative, which emphasizes the use of cognitive tutors. So cognitive tutors play a critical role in helping students come to understand a topic. Rather than a faculty member teaching, the tutor itself recognizes what the student has done. And I use that, don't want to anthropomorphize tutors, but they don't really recognize, but they, they, the tutors guide students based on what it is that students have displayed in recent performance or recent activity. And that'll determine what do they need to know next, or have they conceptually misunderstood the topic so that they can then provide pointed feedback. Another illustration is, Degree Compass. Uh, Degree Compass is uh, basically a recommender system, much like what Netflix or Amazon has done with their systems. It just basically allows individuals to be able to choose or at least be advised which course they would most likely be most successful at. Now this is, keep in mind when we're talking about analytics, especially predictive models, we're not talking about this is what thou shalt do. There's always a margin of error anytime you start interacting with a probabilistic model. But it's just basically saying, all things considered, what we know about you, this is what would be best for you in terms of the next course to take. Or an illustration like this, this is an example of a, uh, a tool that conducts social network analysis of how individuals are connected to one another in a discussion forum. And in this particular research activity, uh, Dawson and McFadden, what they wanted to look at specifically was, what's the impact of being disconnected from the primary social circles of interaction? If you're one of the students on the top left corner, one of the students down to toward the bottom of the diagram that just has a few connections or that is completely disconnected, what is that lack of integration with the broader community in that course? What's the impact of that in, in your eventual grades? Or can we even determine the impact? I mean, at this point, we're likely more talking just correlations, if that. But it's coming to understand everything that students do from how they share an idea to how they interact with one another and what that means ultimately in terms of how can we better advise or better direct students to success. Variety of initiatives for analytics such as Rio Salado are able through predictive models to determine early in a course whether or not a student will fail or pass. Their statement is around 70 plus percent accuracy rate. They'll be able to tell you within just over the first week of the course whether or not a student will eventually complete that course successfully. By the same account, they've used an analytic model that allows various individuals across the system to be notified of any tutor or additional support help that they might need, whether it's from their advisor, from faculty, or some other level of support. So it's really about taking what do we know about the students and then adding a support layer on top of that. 
Other examples, and this comes from that whole field of nudging, you know, where we want to influence and direct student behavior. Uh, Persistence Plus is another illustration. Now this isn't, with these kinds of programs, I, I want to emphasize these are very much stage one programs where we're still trying to take what we understand at some level from research, either in analytics or data analytics, data mining broadly, and trying to translate that into the education space. So Persistence Plus is just a simple example of a way that you nudge students when you start to see certain behavior patterns that maybe aren't ideal, or you want to say, hey, how are things going today? We just want to check in. And what you can see happening here is they're simply collecting data. They're adding a data layer because they don't have access to that now. So that's the broad overview in the context of a few of the aspects of analytics. And now I want to dive into more specifically, what does this look like if you were to deploy or sort of move an analytics model uh, at uh, Penn State, for example? What would the impact or what might an analytics model be like and what role might it play in terms of improving teaching and learning? So I'm going to run through a series of uh, six different elements on this. First of all, I spent a lot of time chatting about this, so I'm not going to get into great detail, but we leave data trails wherever we go. I mean, it, it, on a daily basis, every login with mobile devices, even our movements are being tracked. So it's really about looking at that range of data trails, whether it's physical data or whether it's data that we just have access to uh, because it's sitting in a log somewhere. This is peripheral, not yet integrated, but it'll, we'll bring it together later. The second aspect relates to what I demonstrated earlier around how fields of knowledge and disciplines are connected and related. A student that is said to be educated in a discipline is one that would be able to explain how are pieces related and what's the impact if you adjust or change any of those pieces. And so that's essentially from a semantic web perspective what the intent is to create a structure of related knowledge. How are pieces related to one another? So at this point machine readable content is basically content that the computer system is able to define and say this is how these pieces are connected. Once we have the student profile and we have how the, how the pieces are connected, we start to generate sort of a richer structure of the impact of the student. We end up doing some level of analysis on that then because we now know this is what a student should know in this field. This is what the student currently knows based on data that we're collecting. And through a variety of analysis approaches, huge range, I've just thrown a few up, but conceptual analysis, network analysis, we might look at uh, discourse analysis, how do people engage in conversations, what's the impact of a rhetorical move in terms of changing a student's mind, uh, what is the logic that's being exhibited as students interact with one another. And so as a consequence of this analysis, we end up to something that looks like a prediction. And that prediction then gives us some insight into either we need to do something different with this student. You know, we either need to intervene, uh, we need to give them some additional support because they're at risk of dropping out. Perhaps we can personalize the learning experience. We can give them a custom uh, set of content elements that address the knowledge gaps that they exhibit, or perhaps we can give them, based on content they've recently mastered, the next level of logical content that they need to engage in. And so from a prediction end, we eventually move to something either pedagogical adoption uh, or adaptation, or we move to something that functions more on trying to encourage greater social cohesiveness. Because not everything can be corrected technologically. A large part of what goes on from a student perspective, and by corrected technologically, I mean it's not everything can be an alert that says, oh, you're feeling sad today, you should be happy. In some cases, it requires actually connecting that student to a social system or getting that student involved in a broader uh, social conversation or social interaction. So here's another way of looking at something similar from an analytics model. So, uh, and I'm not going to go into uh, enormous detail on all of these elements, but I just want to emphasize from a, the university's perspective, as you're collecting data from a range of different sources, you end up with something that looks like a central analytics engine where you have a variety of metrics and techniques. And these can include things such as uh, your, your uh, conceptual analysis. It can also include things where you want to spend time, let's say, conducting uh, social a network structure view, you want to look at discourse or even sense making models. What are the kind of cognitive models that students use in different kinds of settings and different kinds of approaches? The research in this area that goes really back to the 60s and even you know, early 70s already looked at how can you take the experiences that individuals have as they interact with the technology system. And what options do you have then to take those experiences and adjust them based on either personal preference or perhaps more importantly based on personal need? 
You know, what is it that a student might need that they might not even be aware of that they need? Because in many instances in education, it's not always what we do that we think is good for us, but it's what a faculty member can identify and draw to our attention that becomes critical. So with this central analytics engine, the range of approaches that are being conducted or uh, uh, being evaluated on the students then lead, as I've already talked about, into the intervention engine, which in turn is well correlated to what's happening from the student's perspective in terms of adapting and changing the course experience. The adaptive aspect of learning is one that's receiving an enormous amount of interest and to some cases it's actually fairly unnerving. There's uh, an organization recently funded by Gates Foundation, uh, I think $100 million was put into it called In Bloom, which basically helps local school systems start to provide personalization and personal content for their students. Uh, there's other foundations that commit it as well. But essentially it will take an enormous amount of student data, suck it out from local regional school systems and use it to create informed and ongoing learning models which will then take the data that's produced from that and generate uh, personal or recommender system to students more locally. So it takes the benefit of large-scale personalization adaptivity and hopefully impacts the quality of experience for each student. For a lot of cases from a faculty end as well, the question starts to arise as to what's the value of this and the actual impact on it because we're now starting to do huge experimentation on students that we don't necessarily have a full awareness of what the actual impact of that is. So if you have students, for example, that you want, well, let's try this, uh, I don't know, whole language uh, learning thing on them and see what the outcome is. These kinds of projects can take years to have an impact, in some cases decades. And so we're at a similar stage from analytics end. It's aligning very nicely with standardized testing. It's aligning very nicely with some of the challenges that uh, we hear about the weakness of the existing school system. So it's sort of, this is an easy fix. We'll just add analytics, maybe a MOOC or two, and we'll have solved education's problems. And so from that end, there's a lot from the analytics dimension that holds enormous potential, but there's as much from the societal and privacy concern perspective that faculty members need to devote a lot of time to thinking and trying to figure out as well. So the, in theory at least, the model looks something like this, setting aside the social concerns, and I'll dive into that in, in just a, a minute. So the model looks along the lines of a learner who's acquiring knowledge either through formal and informal means. Some of the most dramatic aspects of educational change now aren't even in the MOOC format that you're hearing a lot of talk about. They're actually in those activities that are starting to granularize the education experience. University of Wisconsin is one example where they've started to move to a competency-based model. You can get a bachelor's degree without ever stepping into a university campus. And a lot of systems, university in particular, they already have structures in place. Uh, you know, depending on what the language you use, prior learning assessment and recognition, uh, PLR, PLA, any concept of that that says we want to look at what do students learn outside of a classroom setting and how can we fill the gaps that they have because you know, quite honestly, a student that spent their summer between graduating high school and going to university volunteering is going to have a different knowledge profile than a student that spent their summer playing video games. A student that's been involved in, in community work or in sporting activities since they were you know, five years old are similarly going to have a different kind of knowledge structure and knowledge profile. So from the perspective of, of a university taking these students in, the ability to evaluate that profile, not just what they did while they were in our walls or within the campus area, but really broadly, what have they acquired for knowledge, skills, and competence through a range of different activities over the course of their life. There's obviously data ownership issues, there's issues about intrusion. It raises a huge array of questions as well about should students have their own data locker that they take with them if they start at Penn State and then they go, I don't know, send them up to Canada, they go to Athabasca University. Who owns the data that they generated while they were here? Is that student data or is that institutional data? So these are questions that also need to be looked at. The other aspect I've already touched on is about the architecture of knowledge in a discipline. If you can map out knowledge in a space, then it essentially credentialing becomes as simple as comparing student profile with the architect or the structure of knowledge in a space. I mean, obviously making that happen requires a lot of additional work behind the scenes, but that's as simple as it is. And I would argue it's a far more effective credentialing system than what we have today as well. Uh, particularly, one of the biggest benefits here is that if you have a group of, let's say you take uh, 25 students in a classroom, and all 25 students will come into that classroom with a different structure of knowledge. 
One of the huge benefits of social learning, and this is what Coursera has revealed on many levels to uh, faculty who have already taught in the system, one of the big benefits of a system like Coursera is that you are able to fill each other's knowledge gaps as students. So if you have 100 people, the faculty member is likely more aware of the topic than any one of those 100 people. But once you take those 100 people and you connect them socially or technologically in the right way, all of a sudden the knowledge capacity of those 100 students exceeds the knowledge capacity of the faculty member. So that's essentially sort of the model of moving from this discrete kind of we analyze students based on these proxy measures to we do a more direct analysis of students based on what they know and what's evidenced in their activities. A lot of things I've already heard talked about at the conference here around the use of badges uh, relates very well to that kind of a model or approach for a you know, more authentic approach to understanding what's happening with students. Now, so moving on to uh, just a couple of final points then. The aspect of this conversation that's still most up in the air is privacy and ethics. There's a lot that we can do with analytics that we haven't spent time thinking about what are the implications on that. And in some cases, it can be argued that the students that are most at risk are the ones that we most need their data to be able to understand what can we do and how can we help them. So you actually end up having a bit of a, an economic divide where you can only be anonymous if you are wealthy enough not to need help from the system or if you can take care of yourself in that regard. But those students who are at risk or high needs, those are the students that we most aggressively want to collect their data because that's what helps us understand what can we do to intervene. Your socioeconomic status can make a difference in how you do in university. So the privacy questions are enormous. And on some level, this may end up coming out as a transactional concept, much like we do with money. You know, if we, uh, if I, we use money as a transactional agent, you have something I want, I define it to be of suitable value, you know, we exchange money for product or service. In contrast, I think data, when a student comes to Penn State, may well be treated the same way, where a student sits down and you let the student know, all right, if you give us access to your data and if you allow us to analyze your data, we'll be able to provide you with better customized service, we'll be able to provide you with intervention, we'll be able to provide you with uh, counseling support because we'll know you better as a student. And so from a student end, it's as simple as sort of ticking off that box and saying, yeah, that's a fair exchange. You know, as my data for better services, we already do it with Facebook or other social media platforms. You let me use the system, you do a better job of guiding or teaching me, and that seems to be a reasonable approach in that end. So from an educational component, when you start thinking systemic learning analytics deployment, that may be a fair transaction on the part of student, but it still doesn't address those more uncomfortable questions of analytics. There's a report or a paper released uh, last week that looked at, through Facebook, through analysis of just your patterns of liking things, researchers can determine an awful lot about you that you probably aren't aware that they're determining such as sexual orientation, such as preferences that you might have in terms of art or entertainment or culture. These are things that you never have to explicitly state it, but in, uh, the researchers, through analysis of your like patterns, can understand a lot more about you than you think that they have access to. So that raises a critical concern as well. You know, how well can we understand our students? There was an, uh, a paper, not a paper, but a presentation where uh, Eric Schmidt was uh, talking at a conference. He was the CEO of Google at the time. And he said, you know, we're at the stage now. We were sitting around a room. That's when uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, when the three of them were running Google. And he said, we're at a stage now where we can predict the stock market. We know what's going to happen in the stock market tomorrow. And he says, and then we stopped it and we pulled back and we said, but that's illegal. And I think in the uh, analytics space, educationally at least, we haven't quite got to a sense of what is that point? where we cross the privacy threshold, where we move beyond what's good for students and we start to literally you know, live in their basement and start observationally collecting data on students. So finally, to sort of wrap the, the concepts up here, the recognition that the economic structure is changing, the access to knowledge that we have globally is unprecedented, but our ability to comprehend that knowledge through traditional means basically human logic outside of technological intervention, is significantly hampered. So in order to get a better sense of how do we take these ideas and move them into an actionable state, we turn to activities such as data mining and analytics in order to gain a more comprehensive view of the educational space. 
The difficulty arises, though, that we can't just analyze. We have to be able to take what we collect from students and recognize that they're connecting bits and pieces from a variety of places and bringing in a lot of conceptual errors as they're engaged in that experience. So we want to be able to take that and then use that as a means for providing recommender systems that will bring that student up to the level of knowledge that's required in that particular discipline. That's a very lofty goal, to put it mildly. But almost everything that's happening from an analytics end, other than the dashboard that the student sees, other than what the faculty member starts to look at when they log in and see the student performance in a classroom, almost all of that activity is not going to make a direct impact on the student when they first engage with it. So what we see happening underneath the activity that we're engaged in in education is a massive explosion in interest in data and analytics, but unfortunately we don't have the corresponding interest and awareness that the ideologies that we're bringing in, the assumptions we're making about what creativity is, the assumptions that we make about pedagogy, how we start to design and how we flow those ideas into the learning design space and how we flow those ideas into just development of the organizational capacity to stay current and relevant are enormous unresolved issues. So on that note, I'm going to leave you with a rather large problem to think through as you continue to roll out your analytics initiative at Penn State. I think I've been most impressed by the uh, scope and perspective that I've seen coming out of it so far. It's been well thought out and well conceived, but the really tricky issues around analytics aren't what can we do with analytics. The really challenging questions are what shouldn't we do with analytics. Thank you.